currently we are in our section on the effective action, the effective potential and the discussion of symmetries. And now we come to a core topic in this context, namely spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is, as you certainly know, an extremely important topic both in condensed metaphysics as well as in particle physics. And uh, there are spontaneously broken symmetries in the standard model where we also have gauge interactions and uh, there is the Higgs mechanism. But there is also spontaneous symmetry breaking in the context of global symmetries without attached local gauge invariance where the phenomenon is not a Higgs mechanism but a different one. And this is what we are going to talk about. So our topic is spontaneous symmetry breaking. of global symmetries and global in particular means only global, not uh, that at the same time there is also local gauge invariance connected to the same symmetry. And let us begin with some very simple illustrations. And uh, the, as a first illustration, let us simply look at a one-dimensional potential V of x of a particle, like, for example, a classical ball. And uh, this classical ball sees this potential V of x, and it wants to minimize its potential energy. And as you see from the potential, first of all, we have a symmetry namely a symmetry under reflections. x goes to minus x. Obviously, the potential is invariant under this reflection symmetry. And the minimum position is not at the center of the potential at v of x equals 0. But uh, there are two degenerate minima, left and right, and the symmetric point in the middle is unstable. It is a, a local maximum of the potential. And therefore, uh, the position here is unstable against small fluctuations, whereas uh, those two minima are stable. There is no preference for the ball to roll either left or right. But at the end of the day, it will fall into one of the two global minima of the potential. So. We have an unstable symmetric configuration and two degenerate minima, which are both unsymmetric. So this is already a um, case of spontaneous symmetry breaking. I will give the full definition later on. Um, and one question that we are always going to ask is what is the physics for the ball once it is in the minimum and we study small fluctuations of the ball around the minimum. So if you now look at small fluctuations around such um, vacuum configuration or around the ground state configuration, then what is left of the symmetry? So in this case, nothing. Small fluctuations do not uh, see the second um, local minimum far away. They only see the potential in this um, region here. And here in this region, the, there is nothing left of the x goes to minus x symmetry. So therefore, here in this case, small fluctuations do not feel the symmetry. So, as we will discuss in general, spontaneous symmetry breaking means that actually the system is symmetric. However, we are looking at small fluctuations around an unsymmetric configuration, 
and in this case the physics of those uh, are just not symmetric at all. Let's look at a second example. Here we have here a plane and on the plane we put a pole. So this is some pole like a football goal post or something like that. And the pole is vertical and so there is a rotational symmetry of this system. And then we apply some force onto the pole in exactly vertical orientation. Then what happens? At first nothing. But if the force is really very strong then at some point there is a critical force and above the critical force something does happen, namely suddenly the pole will bend. It will bend in one direction. Let's say for example it, uh, you press it downwards and at some point you press it enough such that spontaneously the pole will bend into such a configuration for example. Okay. So what we see here there is first a critical value of the force and above the critical value the symmetric configuration becomes unstable. And you can again describe this situation where the symmetric configuration is unstable in the sense of an effective potential. V of x and y, where x and y, let's say, you look at this point here of the pole, basically the center of the pole, and then you ask where is the center of the pole located. The symmetric configuration would be that the center of the pole is at the origin in the xy plane and uh, here it is bent in one particular direction so x and y uh, are somewhere outside of the origin. Okay, and then if you plot uh, the potential energy of the pole depends on x and y and what it means that the symmetric configuration is unstable is that the potential has this typical Mexican hat shape or wine bottle shape. So this is the effective potential V of X and Y. And so in the symmetric configuration at the origin the potential energy of the pole is high and it becomes energetically favorable that the pole bends into one particular uh, direction. But it doesn't really matter in which direction the pole could bend. It could bend in this direction or in this direction or in this direction. That is um, the, the same energy gain and therefore the potential has this shape. And so there is now uh, again a maximum at the origin and minima outside of the origin. But the difference to the first case is that there are now infinitely many um, ground states, infinitely many degenerate minima corresponding to uh, the pole being basically rotated um, in the xy plane. So we have here infinitely many degenerate minima. And all of them are, of course, unsymmetric. But the unification of all those minima forms a symmetric uh, manifold, but each individual minimum, like this one, is of course not symmetric under rotations in the xy plane. And so now again you would uh, like to study the physics of the pole around the ground state. So we continue to press with this uh, fixed force such that the pole must be bent and then we look at small fluctuations, uh, the physics of the pole around this bent position. And we again ask, uh, is there some remnant effect of the original rotational symmetry for the physics of the pole? 
And now you see there is an effect of the symmetry, namely if you press it like that, then you can rotate the entire pole in the xy plane and that rotation uh, goes along the symmetric, um, let's say, um, axis or the, symmetric, the symmetry transformation. And what that means is that you do not need energy at all to rotate the pole in its bent position. And uh, that is a key feature of spontaneous symmetry breaking in the case of such symmetries. So uh, these minima are connected by continuous symmetry transformations. And therefore, small fluctuations feel the symmetry. Namely, rotations do not cost energy. So, loosely speaking, that is the physics of uh, the symmetry. Rotations of the entire pole do not cost energy. And so, there is uh, one um, kind of fluctuations uh, where you do not need energy. So, I mean, the physics of the pole might be complicated. For example, you might excite vibrational modes around the pole and so on. So, they cost energy. But if you just rotate the entire pole, you do not need energy. And that is the sign of the original symmetry of the system. So here we have spontaneous symmetry breaking of two different systems, namely of a system with a discrete symmetry and of a system with a continuous symmetry. And in the case where we have a continuous symmetry, the spontaneous breakdown leads to a physical effect of small fluctuations around the ground state namely uh, the appearance of an excitation mode which doesn't cost energy. And so that brings us to the definition of spontaneous symmetry breaking. We have a system which is symmetric, but its ground state or in quantum field theory language, the vacuum, the state of lowest energy, um, is unsymmetric. And therefore, spontaneous symmetry breaking, as often stressed, is not really a very good name for the phenomenon because the symmetry is actually not broken. It is just that we have a state which doesn't share the full symmetry and that is actually not a, let's say, fantastically unusual situation because normal physics states do not have the full symmetry of the universe. Um, so the symmetry is not broken, but hidden from fluctuations around the ground state. So, and if we have spontaneous symmetry breaking, then uh, often there is some external control parameter like the force that you can apply here. And uh, this uh, typically in our uh, language and in our applications, such a force might correspond to some parameter in the Lagrangian. Uh, or in other applications, it might correspond to some external parameters like temperature, pressure, or uh, chemical potential whatsoever. And uh, so this uh, example here shows you that very often the spontaneous symmetry breaking is connected to phase transitions. Which happen if you change the values of certain such parameters. And uh, 
The second thing is that in the case of continuous symmetries, there will be those uh, modes, excitation modes, for which you do not need energy, which correspond to the remaining um, symmetry of the system. And these are the so-called Goldstone modes or Goldstone bosons. So these are in condensed matter language gapless modes or in particle physics language massless particles. So, and uh, let us just illuminate this with a few well-known examples. So, uh, let's start with condensed matter examples. In condensed matter physics, uh, the examples are very obvious. So, uh, the most famous systems in condensed matter physics are simply solids. Solids where you have a crystal and uh, you study the physics of electrons inside of the crystal. So let's say here you have the piece of chalk, which is a solid. Then uh, the crystal must be somewhere. Somehow it seems you are all looking at this. <laughs> what is going on? Some questions? Or are we too fast? I think not. Okay, so let's uh, consider the piece of chalk, which is a solid. It consists of a crystal. We have translational invariants, so the chalk could be anywhere, but it must be somewhere, right? And this breaks spontaneously translational invariants. Similarly, we have in principle this Galilei invariants, where you could go into a moving reference frame, um, not Lorentz invariants because it's non-relativistic, but we would have Galilei invariants, but uh, the chalk ha has one particular velocity, and therefore this reference frame where it is at rest is preferred and so Galilei invariance is also spontaneously broken. And these are both continuous symmetries, translational and Galilei invariance, and the spontaneous breaking of those leads to such gapless modes and these are of course the phonons. And you can very easily understand the physics of phonons. Phonons are of course sound waves and uh, extremely gapless mode means that if you have a very, very long wavelength sound wave, let's say infinite wavelength, then it just means that you do a full translation of the entire chalk, right? And uh, that doesn't cost energy. And so therefore you see that an extremely ultra long wavelength sound wave doesn't cost energy and so it corresponds to a gapless mode and the quantized sound wave leads to massless phonons or a dispersion relation of phonons where long wavelength doesn't cost energy. The same magnons uh, in ferromagnets where the ferromagnet must take spontaneously some magnetization. You don't care what orientation it has but it must have one orientation and therefore uh, excitations where essentially at long wavelengths all the uh, uh, individual magnets are rotated, doesn't cost energy, and uh, therefore these magnons also have such a gapless dispersion relation. In particle physics there are pions which are essentially massless particles which correspond to these Goldstone modes corresponding to the spontaneous breaking of some particular symmetry. And here it's actually the least obvious and so we will discuss this uh, probably next week, how pions fit into the picture. So this is our illustration of spontaneous symmetry breaking and let me now point out a very small subtlety in quantum mechanics. Namely, uh, the examples were classical, obviously, and uh, the examples are actually good examples, but nevertheless, if you go to, from them to quantum mechanics, then uh, you discover a small problem, because in quantum mechanics, they wouldn't correspond to spontaneous symmetry breaking. Why not? Because in quantum mechanics, you could have, let's say, um, uh, linear combinations of states, For example, in the upper case, you might have the state where the particle is left, plus or minus 
the state where the particle is right. And typically, actually, the true ground state of the quantum system would be such a linear combination. Either the symmetric or the unsymmetric linear combination of the two states would be the true ground state of the Hamiltonian and uh, the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian in such a symmetric or anti-symmetric state might well be lower than the energy in one of the individual states. And then the true ground state is actually symmetric uh, in case of plus or anti-symmetric in case of minus. And uh, therefore you would not have really spontaneous breaking of the symmetry in the quantum theory. And uh, that corresponds to the fact that uh, there is a transition amplitude of this form. So such a transition amplitude left Hamiltonian right is non-zero. And if that is the case, then you can see that the, um, let's say, expectation value of the Hamiltonian in such a state can be different from the expectation value in the individual states. And then one of the two combinations will be lower than the individual ones. If, however, such a transition amplitude is zero, then such a state will have exactly the same uh, energy as the individual states and you can have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So, uh, and in the case of the uh, second example, you might also remember, I mean, you have rotational invariance and uh, if you just think of ordinary quantum mechanics, then in such a system you would normally expect that the angular momentum operator commutes with the Hamiltonian and then the lowest energy eigenstate would maybe also be an angular momentum eigenstate with angular momentum equal to zero, right? So you might have an L square equal zero eigenstate in example two. An angular momentum eigenstate with eigenvalue zero means just that it has no orientation. It is uh, exactly the opposite of an eigenstate of orientation. Uh, so it basically is a linear combination of all the possible poles bent in all possible directions. And so you have a superposition of all those states and then this state would again not correspond to spontaneous symmetry breaking but to a combination of all states with all possible orientations at the same time. And so therefore, uh, these examples are not complicated enough to generate spontaneous breaking in a quantum theory because of this effect. And uh, you can only have spontaneous symmetry breaking in a quantum theory if you uh, arrange it such that such transition amplitudes are actually zero. And you can only achieve that in general if you have infinitely many degrees of freedom, where basically such a small amplitude would come to the power of n, where n goes to infinity, and that converges then to zero. So we need infinitely many degrees of freedom. So that is similar to the thermodynamic limit. for spontaneous symmetry breaking in a quantum theory. And that basically means we can have spontaneous symmetry breaking in a quantum field theory, but not easily in such an ordinary uh, one degree of freedom quantum theory. So therefore for us it's okay, we will do quantum field theory. Okay, so this is the introduction to spontaneous symmetry breaking. Any initial questions to this? I will now do two illustrations which are still on the classical level, so using quite simple techniques before we go to more complicated quantum proofs of Goldstone's theorem and so on. So, okay, no questions. Then let us look at a concrete example of a field theory where we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. 
And let me use as an example uh, the standard model Higgs sector because in the parallel standard model lecture we also discussed it. And anyway, it's a very important example, obviously. Standard model Higgs sector has one complex doublet, complex uh, scalar doublet. Um, and uh, for this lecture, let us simply say a complex doublet contains four real fields. Okay? Four real fields, namely the real and imaginary part of the upper and lower component. And let's just summarize them as four real fields. And uh, as we discussed in the standard model lecture, the actual global symmetry of the Higgs potential in the standard model is not SU2 cross U1, but it is SU2 cross SU2, which is then broken to the custodial SU2 uh, remnant symmetry. SU2 left cross SU2 right. So that is the original symmetry of the Higgs potential. And actually, a group theoretically, that is the same as the group SO4. So it is locally isomorphic. The uh, uh, Lie algebras have the same commutational relations. And therefore, for our purposes, uh, let us um, simply look at four real fields with an SO4 symmetry, which is a real symmetry for four real fields, which is a very natural symmetry. We didn't discuss SO4 in the standard model because there the SU2 times SU2 breaking to SU2 is uh, the uh, way to understand the physics best. But uh, for now, let us simply look at SO4. So, and then let us look at such a field theory. We have a field vector out of four real fields, phi vector consisting of phi 1 up to phi 4. These are the four real fields corresponding to the standard model Higgs doublet. They are real. And the Lagrangian is simply the one of scalar fields, d mu phi i, d mu phi i minus potential v of phi. And the potential is now SO4 symmetric. So it uh, is rotationally symmetric, where you rotate the four real components with an orthogonal matrix. And so uh, to achieve it, it means the potential depends only on phi vector square. Then it's rotationally invariant in four dimensions, right? As simple as that. And so the potential depends only on this. So it has one term minus mu square times phi vector square plus lambda over 2 phi vector to the fourth power. And then the potential mimics the standard model Higgs potential, but written in terms of this real field vector. And we set mu square and lambda positive. And then we know we have here such a wine bottle potential, um, which breaks spontaneously the symmetry. So let's just draw a picture. We have this SO4 symmetric potential. So I cannot draw five dimensions with four real fields and then one potential. So let's look at two components, phi 1, pi, phi 2, and here the potential. And then it looks obviously like this. So this is the potential. It has this wine bottle shape because of the uh, minus mu square term. So the symmetric configuration where all the fields are at the origin is unstable. And uh, we get spontaneous symmetry breaking the fields in the vacuum must acquire some non-vanishing value. But uh, there is a continuum of degenerate ground states which are connected to each other by rotations in this space of fields. So uh, it doesn't matter which ground state we choose, but we must choose one ground state. Let us choose one ground state. And without loss of generality, we can choose the one 
where just one out of the four fields is non-zero. Let us choose phi vacuum is given like this, uh, zero, 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 V, where V is non-zero. And uh, if you minimize the potential like we did in the standard model lecture, then we get mu square must be equal to uh, lambda times V square. And so now what you also see is that the vacuum state breaks the symmetry. It is obviously not invariant under SO4 rotations, but you see that uh, not the entire symmetry is broken, but there is a remaining symmetry of the vacuum. Namely, under what rotations is it uh, still invariant? It is still invariant under SO3 rotations of the first three components. So it is still SO3 invariant, where you simply leave the fourth one untouched, but you do anything you want with the first three components. And so uh, the shorthand notation is this one, so, or let's say this, we have a system which has an SO4 symmetry, but the vacuum has only an uh, SO3 subgroup symmetry. Let us now study fluctuations around the ground state, in other words, around the vacuum. And in order to do it, we write phi vector uh, as ordinary phi plus this uh, phi vacuum, or in other words, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and then phi 4 plus v. So phi 4 is treated differently. And so now the normal phis, they are uh, fields which vanish in the vacuum, and they describe fluctuations around the ground state. And then we want to set up our field theory as a function of the normal phase, and uh, then our field theory will describe the physics of fluctuations around this chosen ground state. And so in particular, we need to look at the potential V of uh, the original phi is now given as follows. So we have um, um, actually minus mu square, uh, so we can probably do completion of the square. Then we can write this as lambda over 2 of phi square minus v square, and the whole thing squared plus an irrelevant constant. And then we have lambda over 2. And phi square, if we plug in this, is the same as the normal phi square plus v square minus v square cancels, and then plus 2 times phi 4 times v, and the whole thing squared. That is a very useful way to write it, because now if you evaluate the square, then you see that in the square of this round bracket, there appears one term with field squared and all the other terms have higher powers than squares of the fields. And so the square term gives 2 lambda times v um, square times phi 4 square. That comes from the square of this in the binomial formula. And then we have trilinear and quartic terms. And this term is interesting because it corresponds to a mass term, so it gives us the information about the masses of particles created um, by fluctuations around the vacuum. And so uh, typically we looked at the bilinear part of the Lagrangian, bilinear now in the normal phase, which is the kinetic term, one half d mu 
phi i times d mu phi i. So in the kinetic term, there is no difference between the original phi and the normal phi because the vacuum expectation value has no derivative. And then from the potential, we simply get this minus 2 lambda v square phi 4 square minus uh, nothing anymore. That is the only um, bilinear part of the potential. And so what does it tell us? The bilinear part of the Lagrangian, if we go to the quantization of the free theory, uh, tells us about the particles um, and their masses which are generated by this quantum field theory, at least in the classical level. And so here we can read off what the particles and their masses are. Namely, we have four scalar fields, phi 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, there is only a mass term for phi 4. And all the other ones have no mass term. Therefore, three of them are massless. And one of them is massive, and that is its mass. So let's write it down. We have one massive field or fluctuation with mass m4 square equal, we have the correct normalization would be 1 half, so 4 times lambda v square. And we have three massless, and these are then the goldstone Uh, particles, phi 1, 2, 3, with m 1, 2, 3, square equal 0. And that still corresponds to the standard model, where we have three different goldstone fields, namely in the standard model we would say the goldstone plus minus and the goldstone zero, which are exactly those three. And by the way, the symmetry pattern also corresponds to the standard model, where we said the full global symmetry was SU2 cross SU2, which is broken down to the custodial SU2 Custodial SU2 is equivalent to this SO3. It is uh, again locally isomorphic as a group. And so uh, that corresponds to this uh, global uh, aspects of the standard model. And so uh, you see now that if you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, it can happen that you have massless fields corresponding to Goldstone bosons and corresponding to the broken symmetries. But it can also happen that, they, that you have a remnant symmetry of the vacuum, and it can happen that you can have massive particles which are unrelated to the Goldstone modes. And uh, in the standard model, that would of course be the Higgs particle and the Higgs field. And uh, these are the three Goldstone bosons, and in the standard model, they would be unphysical because we have also local gauge invariance, but we are not considering that here, no. Good, so let us now study the very same example, but in more formal terms, such that you see from this concrete case, um, what are the ingredients that, uh, how you can investigate such um, situations in general, uh, setting up formalisms, uh, which can then be used for general systems and also at the quantum level. So in other words, let us give some explanations. We had this SO4 rotational symmetry, and it is, as you already saw in many other contexts, very useful uh, in quantum field theory to study the symmetries on the infinitesimal level. And then we need generators. of uh, the SO4 group and study infinitesimal transformations. So in principle we have an SO4 matrix R which is orthogonal R times R transpose 
is equal to the unit matrix. And in order to write it in infinitesimal form, we would write R as the unit matrix minus I times alpha A times T A, where T are the generators of the SO4 Lie algebra. So, and the question would be, how many generators are there? How many generators does SO4 have? And how do they look like? And how do infinitesimal transformations uh, act on the system that we have just studied? And then we will investigate this uh, inside three massless Goldstone bosons, one massive, one uh, remnant symmetry, and so on, on the level of the generators because that is something that we can do always and also on higher order level. So uh, if this is orthogonal and has determinant equal to one, it means that the generators TA, they are uh, Hermitian, TA equal to TA dagger. But uh, the matrix R is also real, so TA must be totally uh, imaginary. So we have a, 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 this is then equal to minus TA transpose. And um, uh, what else? The trace of TA is of course zero because uh, the determinant of R is one. So we must search for a basis of four by four matrices TA which have trace zero which are totally imaginary and which are anti-symmetric. And how many linearly independent such matrices are there? That is actually extremely uh, simple to see. Um, there are six such matrices and let me immediately give you the answer of those six matrices. Then you will immediately see the logic. So uh, the first example has this one, zero minus i, i, zero and the rest is zero. Then the next example, zero, 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 i minus i here, like this, zero. Then the next example, zero, 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 minus i, i, zero here. So these are all matrices, the three by three blocks that you see here are familiar to you from angular rotation matrices in ordinary quantum mechanics because they would correspond to the generators of SO3. And then there are three additional ones. So these correspond to rotations around the three first components and now let's bring into the game the fourth component and then we simply have the following. We have a zero block matrix, three by three block matrix zero, and then we have here minus i, zero, 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 plus i, zero, zero, zero. So this anti-symmetric, purely imaginary matrix, and so on. Uh, so let me maybe squeeze it here. So then zero block, zero, minus i, i, zero, zero, i, zero and last zero, zero, minus i, zero, zero, i, zero. Okay, so these are three additional matrices and uh, by looking at it, I think it is completely obvious without any further explanations that uh, these are all linearly independent, uh, anti-symmetric, totally imaginary and traceless matrices that you can write down. And so you also see in this way that uh, I split the generators already such that you see the subgroup generators for SO3 and uh, the additional ones that make up the full SO4. Now let us describe the invariance of our system in terms of this. So infinitesimally speaking, we would have delta V equal zero under um, uh, under um, phi goes to phi plus delta phi, where delta phi is given by minus i alpha a 
times T A phi for any alpha A. Okay, so alpha A are fixed real parameters, um, uh, x independent parameters because we have a global symmetry and then we have this infinitesimal transformation. Then we can look at the vacuum. The vacuum has the following transformation, delta phi in the vacuum is given by minus i alpha a t a uh, phi in the vacuum. And what is that? Minus i alpha a t a times 0, 0, 0 v. That is the uh, transformation of our vacuum state. And now the question is, is the vacuum symmetric or is the vacuum unsymmetric? And that is visible now by looking at exactly this symmetry transformation of the vacuum. If the vacuum were symmetric, then this delta phi vacuum would be zero. However, it is not zero. Uh, but it is zero under certain conditions. So what um, is the structure, the symmetry structure of the vacuum? You can see it by applying the generators TA onto the vacuum. There are six generators and for each of them you can evaluate TA applied onto the vacuum. What do you obtain if you apply the six TAs given there onto the vacuum? So I introduced an abbreviation for this TA acting on the vacuum. I introduced the simple DA. So we have six, let's say, vectors in field space DA. For every generator, there is such a vector. And it is a vector in field space. In other words, it is a four component quantity. And uh, so did you know? Uh, figure out what they are. They correspond to the change of the vacuum. I asked you what happens if you apply the generators onto the vacuum. In other words, what is the result for these DA? Yep. Right, which of them? Yep. Right, so let's say if we have A equal 1, 2, 3, then using the notation DA equal 0. That means the vacuum is invariant under SO3, as we already know, but this is the formal way to write it down with generators. So DA for A, 1, 2, 3 vanishes. The vacuum is invariant under SO3. And then for the other ones, you already saw it, it is not zero. Whatever it is, it is not zero. But actually, what is it? Uh, the important question is not exactly what it is, but we have three vectors, d4, d5, d6. Are these three linearly independent or are they linearly dependent? d4, d5, d6 obtained from applying this, this, this matrix onto the vacuum. So maybe let's do it, dA equal. So for the first one, we obtain, of course, minus i times v, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus i, v, 0, 0, and 0, 0, minus i, v, 0, okay? So in other words, they are linearly independent. Therefore, the space spanned by the vectors dA is three-dimensional. Or you can also view it as a matrix. The rank of the matrix dA 
i. i corresponds to that index and a corresponds to this index is 3. So and this rank tells us how many uh, symmetries are spontaneously broken. It corresponds to the number of broken generators and uh, let's call it n broken. This is the number of broken symmetries. Then let us look at the mass terms because uh, in the end we obtained that there is one massive field, the Higgs field, and three massless Goldstone fields. Let us look at the mass terms in general. The mass terms are obtained by looking at V of phi in the normal phi's, in other words, in terms of the fluctuations around the vacuum and taking only the bilinear parts of the potential. These are the mass terms. So that is given by one half second derivative of V with, with respect to phi i phi j times phi i phi j. That is by Taylor expansion the bilinear part of that. And we could abbreviate this as the mass matrix m square ij phi i phi j. And then the question is, what is the property of the mass matrix for our scalar field fluctuations around the vacuum? What can we learn about the mass matrix? Let us look at what we can learn from the symmetry invariance. The symmetry invariance tells us that zero is the same as V of the transformed potential minus the original potential. Here we need to plug in the original fields, um, but that is also the same as V of that plus uh, delta phi minus V of phi. The potential is symmetric no matter which parametrization we use, where uh, this is defined to be equal as the delta phi of the original fields because the transformation must remain the same in order to get the invariance. Okay, but if we uh, apply this and uh, work out um, the infinitesimal transformation, then uh, we can do a Taylor expansion in the small delta phi, or here Taylor expansion in the small delta phi, and uh, then the zero order term cancels, v of phi minus v of phi. Then we have a first order term, which is the first derivative of v with respect to phi i times delta phi i, um, plus the second order term, plus one half, second derivative v of phi with respect to phi i phi j times delta phi i times delta phi j. Now in this expansion if we go to the vacuum, so this is valid in general, but if we go to the vacuum then uh, this vanishes because in the vacuum the first derivative of the potential vanishes by a definition because the vacuum is defined as a stationary point of the potential. So the derivative vanishes in the vacuum. So therefore, if we apply this definition in the vacuum at phi equals zero, then uh, this here vanishes and we simply obtain one half times that, which is the mass matrix m square ij times delta phi i delta phi j in the vacuum. But what is delta phi i and delta phi j in the vacuum? These are exactly our vectors d. So delta phi in the vacuum, which is the same as delta small phi in the vacuum is minus i alpha times d. So therefore, it follows, the left hand side was zero, 
zero is equal to the mass matrix ij multiplied with any such vectors d a i d b j. What is the mathematical meaning of the last equation uh, that I wrote down and that is valid for all a, b? The mathematical meaning of this is that we have here eigenvectors of a matrix with zero eigenvalue. So the DAs are eigenvectors of the mate mass matrix with eigenvalue zero. Some of the DAs are zero, then for those DAs which are zero, the equation is trivial and doesn't tell us anything. But some of the DAs are non-zero, and then the equation tells us that the mass matrix has a non-trivial eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. Therefore, the determinant of the mass matrix must be zero. And actually, we know that there are precisely three linearly independent eigenvectors with eigenvalue zero. And therefore, uh, if you would diagonalize the mass matrix, there would be three zeros on the diagonal. M square has um, three times eigenvalue zero. So that corresponds to the number n broken equal three goldstone bosons. So we can learn from the symmetry discussion uh, Without evaluating the Lagrangian, we can see that there must be three massless particles in the theory because the mass matrix would have three um, eigenvalues with value zero. Okay. So that is, of course, a confirmation of our direct calculation. But uh, the second way is more formal. And it introduces objects like these vectors dA, which directly describe the nature of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And you can easily guess, I guess, I hope, uh, that this is something that can be generalized because for any symmetry and for any theory, you will be able to write down some generators uh, acting on the vacuum. So this is an object that you can always form and then you will always obtain such a matrix and you can determine its rank which gives you the number of massless goldstone modes of the respective system. And uh, you see that uh, you can apply it to the um, potential by looking at the symmetry transformation of the potential and then you derive this uh, number of eigenvalues of the mass matrix. And that is also a method that can be generalized. Now I think I have prepared you sufficiently to go uh, directly to the completely general case and to the quantum level. And we will prove the Goldstone theorem, uh, namely that uh, when you have spontaneous symmetry breaking in the quantum theory, there exists such massless Goldstone modes. Um, uh, in, in very general terms, yes, uh, but more specifically, it depends on what symmetry you are looking at. It depends on the nature of the generators of the symmetry. So if the generators of the symmetry have basically Bose statistics, then the outcome will be bosons. If they would have Fermi statistics, the outcome would be fermions. And if the generators of the symmetry transformation commute with uh, Poincaré transformations, then they behave like scalars with respect to Lorentz transformations. And then the outcome must be scalar fields. If you would have symmetry generators, which are, let's say, um, have non-trivial commutation relations with Poincaré, then you might assign something like a spin 
to the symmetry transformations. That is the case in supersymmetry, for example. And then a corresponding Goldstone boson might be not a boson, but a fermion with spin one half as an example. Um, but all the symmetries we will look at uh, will be uh, not supersymmetry, but bosonic and scalar symmetries. And therefore, the Goldstone bosons will always actually be bosons with a spin zero. And, and one interesting point which we will actually discuss is uh, that the Goldstone bosons do not have to be uh, corresponding to elementary scalar fields that are present in the theory. It can very well be that the Goldstone bosons are dynamical uh, corresponding to composite operators in the fields and might be described not by the objects that you see in the Lagrangian, but nevertheless they appear as particles. And uh, the proof, at least one of the proofs I will give, will cover that situation. Uh, the other proof I will give will not cover that situation. I will give you two proofs of the Goldstone theorem. But in general, that can happen. For example, pions. Uh, if you interpret pions as Goldstone bosons, they are bound states of QCD. And uh, pion fields do not appear in the QCD Lagrangian, but nevertheless, they appear as Goldstone bosons of some spontaneously broken global continuous symmetry. We will discuss that. But let us first discuss the proof of the Goldstone theorem, such that you see what I am talking about. So spontaneous symmetry breaking on the quantum level. and Goldstone's theorem. Let us say we have a continuous uh, symmetry of the Lagrangian and of the path integral measure. such that we have a quantum theory which uh, shares the symmetry. Then we have already discussed in section 422 what is the consequence for the effective action at all orders of the quantum theory, namely 0 is equal to the x integral of delta phi i of x expectation value in the presence of sources j times the derivative of the effective action with respect to phi i of x. That is a generic result. Let's call it star because we will need it later on. But we have established this equality. It is the manifestation of the original Lagrangian symmetry on the level of green functions of the theory. And instead of the Lagrangian transformation delta phi, there appears an expectation value of an object where delta phi co uh, corresponds to a composite operator, maybe, in the presence of sources j. That is the general uh, statement which remains valid in uh, the case of spontaneous breaking because it was derived without talking about breaking or non-breaking of symmetries. But now we need to uh, bring in the property of the vacuum in order to study whether the symmetry is spontaneously broken because that just refers to a property of the vacuum. So what are the properties of the vacuum? So in the vacuum, by definition, the sources j for the functional integral are zero and the fields have a vacuum expectation value phi vacuum, which is given by minus, uh, sorry, plus dw with respect to dj at j equals zero, where w is the generating functional for connected green functions. Okay, and vice versa, the derivative of gamma uh, with respect to phi at phi equal phi vacuum is equal to the corresponding source, which in that case is zero. Okay. 
So the first derivative of gamma in the vacuum vanishes, and we interpreted that by saying that the vacuum is a stationary point of, um, of gamma, of the effective action. So uh, the next point is not really a big deal, but let's assume for simplicity that a phi has been shifted such that phi vacuum vanishes, okay? So if you would start out with a case where the field operator has a non-vanishing expectation value, then you would simply redefine your operator plus a constant which is always possible without changing the physics, and then afterwards the operator expectation value would be zero. So that doesn't uh, tell you anything about spontaneous symmetry breaking, it just is this reparametrization going from the original phi to the normal phi. We, you can always do that, that is no loss of generality at all, but it makes the calculation a little bit uh, simpler. The big deal, is that we now assume spontaneous symmetry breaking, namely the vacuum is not invariant. And what that means in this notation is that uh, delta phi, the field variation in the vacuum doesn't vanish. And that means that exactly this quantity expectation value of delta phi i of x at j equals zero is non-zero. That is now our starting condition. So this is in the current language the statement of spontaneous symmetry breaking because now it means the vacuum is not invariant. So we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now we could just uh, derive from that the Goldstone theorem and the existence of massless particles, but let us um, go to a more specific case and also assume a Lie group structure such that our variations correspond to some Lie group generators, in that case delta phi i at j equals zero could be written as some parameters alpha a uh, with delta a of phi i at j equals zero with some parameters alpha a uh, like before which parameterize our transformations. And then again we could define such vectors d a i vectors in the space of fields for every generator there is such a vector and uh, for each A it is a vector in the space of fields. And if those vectors or some of them are non-zero then we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So these DAs they parameterize the spontaneous symmetry breaking and then we have the Goldstone theorem. There exist as many massless particles as spontaneously broken generators. That means as rank of the matrix DAI, which you can call the number n broken of broken generators. Let me just make some space for the proof. Uh, I deleted, unfortunately, our starting equation. The starting equation was the basic symmetry statement uh, where you had zero equal to uh, this times d gamma by d phi. That was the symmetry. And so the proof simply starts from there. And we take this equation star and apply a first derivative, functional derivative, with respect to some field operator, let's say phi j, 
at position y to that equation. So if we do that, then we have 0 is equal to an x integral of the following. So we have a product rule here, delta phi i. A derivative, functional derivative of that object with respect to phi j at y times d gamma by d phi i at x. And so this object here must in this context be treated as a functional of the fields even though originally it was a functional of j, but j must be regarded then as a functional of the fields in turn by going through the Legendre transformation. Plus, second term of the product rule, this object delta phi i times now the second derivative of gamma with respect to phi j at y and phi i at x. Okay. And now, similarly to uh, the explicit example, we want to study the mass terms. And uh, the mass terms correspond to second derivatives of the effective action uh, in the vacuum. And so let us go to the vacuum. So in the vacuum, we put now all the fields phi to 0. So remember that without loss of generality, we assume that in the vacuum the fields are zero. Then we now set all the fields to zero. And then by definition, uh, the first derivative of gamma with respect to phi vanishes. That's what we set here. First derivative vanishes. That's the definition of the vacuum. Therefore, simply this whole term drops out. And we obtain integral over x of that object in the vacuum times the second derivative of gamma with respect to phi j of y and phi i at x. This combination here vanishes. What, however, is this object in the vacuum? In the vacuum, this becomes a constant this is an x-independent constant. Because in the vacuum, there is no way that the expectation value of an operator depends on x. Therefore, it is an x-independent constant. And uh, you can think of this as before. This would be this TA applied on the vacuum expectation value. So this is indeed an x-independent constant. And here, that is just a generalization of something like this. Okay, So it's a constant. A constant vector in field space, which doesn't depend on x. So we can pull it out of the integral. And so our equation becomes, uh, actually, we can also pull out the alphas. So for any a, because this is independent of the alphas, we simply get 0 is equal to dA i times the x integral of the second derivative of uh, gamma with respect to d phi j and d phi i at x. What does it mean if you perform an x integral of something uh, which depends on x over the entire x space? That simply means a Fourier transformation. Imagine you have here times e to the minus i p x. Now it is a Fourier transformation, and you evaluate the outcome at momentum p. But that wasn't there, so it means you evaluate the outcome at momentum p equals 0. So therefore, this simply corresponds to the Fourier transformation. And you obtain 0 is equal to dIA times the second derivative. And we use this shorthand notation, gamma derivative with respect to phi j phi i at momentum p equals 0. 
that is the equation that follows from spontaneous symmetry breaking and that is valid for all A. And so you see now the parallelism to the previous discussion. We have here a generalization of the mass matrix, namely the second derivative of gamma at P equals zero and it is annihilated by a number of vectors. A number of linearly independent vectors annihilate the effective mass matrix at all orders and then we get the same conclusion as we had before, namely Goldstone's theorem. Let us spell it out. So let me simply write some text. So there are at least n broken uh, zeros, zero eigenvalues of this gamma phi i phi j at p equals zero. And that means at least so many poles of the inverse, gamma phi phi inverse ij. But what is the inverse of gamma at p equals zero? The inverse of the second derivative of gamma, I hope you all remember that, was nothing but a full propagator. This is the full propagator between fields phi i and phi j. So this here corresponds to the full uh, time ordered expectation value of the field operators phi i, phi j at p equals zero. Okay. So that is what we derived when we introduced the effective action gamma. The second derivative of it is the inverse of the full propagators. And so therefore, what it tells us that the full propagator matrix between all the possible fields of the theory at momentum equals zero has so many poles. A pole of a propagator means a mass of a one particle state. The poles of propagators correspond to the masses of one particle states in the theory and that is a non-perturbative statement. You know it from three level propagators, but uh, there is the all order counterpart of the same statement that poles correspond to masses of one particle states. So therefore there are n broken massless one particle states in the theory, which are the Goldstone bosons. I say in general could be bigger, that would be an accident, but we know for sure that there are n broken such massless particles. So that is the proof of the Goldstone theorem. It's a non-perturbative uh, all order proof. Not so difficult and it uses the formalism of the effective action. Now you see that, oh, okay, question, yeah. By accident, uh, it could be bigger uh, because, I mean, uh, Goldstone, so this thing here tells us that there will be so many zero eigenvalues, but of course, it doesn't mean, I mean, uh, there could be more. But uh, if there is more, then this has nothing to do with uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, it's just accidental. Yeah, 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 yes. And you have three, lin let's say, three linearly independent eigenvectors to the eigenvalue zero, but by accident the matrix could nevertheless have five linearly independent eigenvectors, but you don't know about them. So that is what I mean. So this is just uh, to be correct in all cases. Coming back to your other question, this proof has made use of the elementary scalar fields of the theory. So we have a theory defined in terms of some set of fields, phi i, phi j, and uh, they are the fields which appear as the arguments of our effective action. So they are also the fields which appear in the Lagrangian. And so here uh, we used that in terms of those fields, 
we get spontaneous symmetry breaking and then some combination of those elementary fields will make up the Goldstone bosons. That is very general but not fully general because it doesn't allow for the possibility of these composite fields like pions. And uh, of course one can generalize this and go uh, modify the effective action such that the phi's also can correspond to composite fields, but uh, that would be an extra piece of work. But let me show you anyway a completely different proof of the Goldstone theorem, which is also uh, very important and was done basically in the literature at the same time as that proof in the 60s by Goldstone, Weinberg, Nambu and some others and which shows you directly that uh, there doesn't have to be a correspondence to elementary fields of the Lagrangian. And uh, the second proof works totally without reference to the effective action. It uses entirely different methods and so it's also good for you to see what kind of methods can be used in order to derive properties in quantum field theory. Let's hope that we can maybe still squeeze it in in five minutes. So if you have a continuous symmetry, you know that uh, there is also the Noether theorem and you get a conserved current. B mu J A mu equals zero. And in a quantum theory where we do canonical quantization, this becomes an operator equation. So there is an operator J mu which satisfies that equation in the Heisenberg picture. And there is a not so well known consequence of the Noether theorem which I simply quote, namely the commutation relation of J0 with uh, any other fields gives you back the symmetry transformation of the respective fields. That follows from uh, Poisson brackets in the classical theory. If you work them out and you see that plugging in the representation of the Noether current and uh, evaluating Poisson brackets, then uh, this generates the field variation which uh, gave the definition of the current. And in the quantum theory in canonical quantization, uh, Poisson brackets are replicated on the level of commutator. So such a commutator basically gives you the field variation. Then if the vacuum is not invariant, it means that uh, the current J A zero applied onto the vacuum state doesn't give zero because the interpretation of the current is that it generates infinitesimal transformations and so that would not be zero. By the way, in many textbooks you find uh, that you get a charge operator which would be the space integral over the charge density, so J zero is the charge density, so that would be the integral. And then often people simply say Q applied onto the vacuum isn't zero, but that would be the space integral of this J zero acting on the vacuum. But uh, J zero acting on the vacuum, if it's not zero, it must be X independent because no X is preferred by the vacuum. And then you integrate something X independent over all of space, which is divergent. So that means that this operator that is sometimes written down is not well defined. And that is also a signal of spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, that you can remember. The current is always defined and it is always conserved, but the charge, the overall charge, which would be the space integral over the current, that is not a well defined operator. So that is also, um, let's say, a property of spontaneously broken systems. 
So therefore, let us not use the charge operator. It can be used in loose, used in loose terms, but uh, let's stick to the current that is sufficient. Then uh, from quantum field theory postulates, uh, you know that, and that is now where basically composite fields and everything come in. We do not make use of the Lagrangian, but we make use of fundamental postulates, which tell us that in a field theory, every state is connected to any other state by applying local field operators. Therefore, if that is not zero, it can be mapped to the vacuum by applying some local field operator. And that means the following thing, that there exists some operator between uh, such that between the vacuum state, the commutator of some operator phi of x and j mu a of y vacuum is not zero. So the postulates tell us that there must be such a local field operator. And that might be a composite field operator, which is a product of some other field operators. But there must be such a, a possibility to construct some phi of x from the operators in the theory, such that this commutator between the vacuum gives a non-zero result. And that is then the basic starting point to analyze spontaneous symmetry breaking. And I think time is unfortunately practically up. But uh, by looking at this equation, literally, you can directly conclude the existence of a massless state in the theory. A massless one particle state in the theory must be present if you have this equation, which is non-zero. And it would take maybe five minutes to prove it. Uh, maybe we just do it and hope that nobody comes in. The logic of the proof is basically uh, similar to the so-called kellin lehmann representation for propagators in non perturbative quantum field theory. So let me, let me follow my notes precisely to make it quick. Uh, we insert now a basis of states. We insert a basis of states here between these two operators and uh, uh, basically insert a completeness relation. So what is a basis of states? A basis of states consists of the vacuum state. It consists of one particle states. So these are one particle states of particle type A with momentum P and a rest mass MA and multi-particle states which depend on four momentum p mu. So the difference between one particle states and multi-particle states is that a one particle state is defined by saying the particle type and the three momentum because then the energy is fixed by the rest mass. For a multi-particle state, if you fix the three momentum, the energy is not fixed because it would depend on relative velocities. And therefore, you have four independent momentum components. And the states uh, depend continuously on all four components of the momentum. That is the big difference. So let us insert a basis. The vacuum state doesn't contribute here um, because in the commutator, it drops out. So the two commutator terms would give the same if you insert the vacuum state. So only the one and multi-particle states contribute. Then we have here basically a sum over all the particle states and uh, the integral over the three momentum dp tilde, where dp tilde depends on the rest mass ma such that the energy is fixed in terms of the rest mass and we have only a three-dimensional momentum integral. And then from this term we get vacuum field operator, one particle state, then one particle state current j mu a of y vacuum minus uh, the reverse order. 
and similar for multiparticle states, multiparticle states which have a similar structure, but a D4P integral with a similar integrand. Now, what can we learn about this? We can learn something about the expectation value of the current here. This expectation value between a momentum eigenstate, the vacuum, and a, a local operator, which depends on y, must have a particular dependence. First of all, you can do a translation by the um, uh, length y, and then you get an exponential factor e to the plus i p y. Then you would have here the argument zero, and then you have a mu dependent expectation value between the momentum eigenstate and the vacuum. So this can only be proportional to the four momentum p mu times a normalization constant n. The normalization constant depends on the particle type Na, but uh, cannot depend on P because of Lorentz invariance. And this thing here is also proportional to the e to the minus i p x. You can again do a translation by uh, x and then transform it uh, to phi of zero, and then you get some constant, which this is multiplied with. OK, so therefore, the whole thing would be sum of A, then d p tilde m A of a constant proportional to a constant n A times p mu e to the minus i p x plus i p y minus the opposite order minus multiparticle state contributions. And uh, now we have to look at something else, namely the current is conserved and therefore zero is equal to the expectation value of d mu times a comma p j a vacuum. Uh, and in momentum or in general, so if you apply this, that pulls down from the exponential just a factor of p, and then we get zero is equal to p square, the momentum square, times this uh, constant n a. Zero is equal to p square times the constant n a. That means, so that is the rest mass m a square times n a a, either the constant n is zero or the rest mass is zero. In other words, the only non-vanishing contributions come from states with rest mass equal zero. And if you would do the same for the multiparticle states, then for the multiparticle states, you could write down the same equation, but because of the continuity, then you would say uh, the uh, multiparticle states depend continuously on p square, and p square can continuously go to zero. In that case, uh, the normalization constant would have to be zero for all p. And therefore, the multiparticle states cannot contribute only single particle states can contribute if they have rest mass equal to zero. And now the point is, can it be that there is no contribution at all? No, that cannot be, because we started from the fact that this thing is non-zero. That is the hallmark of spontaneous symmetry breaking, so the whole thing must be non-zero. Therefore, in this uh, setup, there must be some non-vanishing contributions but the only non-vanishing contributions can come from particles with rest mass zero, and therefore there must be particles with rest mass zero. And they do not have to correspond to elementary fields of the Lagrangian, but you can see 
if you act with a spontaneously broken current onto the vacuum, you generate something proportional to those one particle states. So let's simply say there exist Goldstone bosons. And they are generated by J0 acting onto the vacuum. So that is an interesting additional piece of information. Okay, that's it. So thanks and see you in the afternoon for the exercise.